We are live. Good morning from India. Welcome to the virtual Horasis India meeting, coming live to you in whichever part of the world you may be. I'm Venki Vembu, a journalist in India, and I'm your host for one of this morning's sessions. In this session, we hope to go over some aspects of the startup ecosystem in India, the challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic, and the strategies and policy initiatives that can help India re-emerge as a startup nation. This edition of the Horasis India meeting is being organized in pretty extraordinary circumstances with a global pandemic raging and countries going into lockdowns for extended periods. This has had enormous knock-on effects on the economy. We've all felt the impact of this across borders and professions in myriad ways. Some of these effects that we may feel on a day-to-day -day basis are somewhat benign. As a journalist, I work from home with no serious loss of productivity, although I do miss the social interactions that are an intrinsic part of my profession. Personally, the most serious dislocation I have experienced is that for nearly three months, I had to go without a haircut. We can live with that. But businesses which have much more skin in the game have been very severely impacted. The world of startups in particular has suffered grievous blows. The Indian startup ecosystem has not been immune to all of this. It faces challenges across the spectrum from funding, which impacts valuations, to expansion of the market. We'll get a measure of the, some of this negative impact from the panel of experts we have lined up for you. I'll introduce you to them in just a minute. But as great as the challenges are, we are also seeing signs that innovation continues to flourish in these difficult times. The Indian government, too, has responded with policy measures, including an opening up of new business spaces for private players. Some of these expand the canvas for startups to operate. What can startups do to seize the moment and convert this crisis into an opportunity? We will look to our panel of experts, each of whom addresses the question from their fairly unique perspective to provide actionable strategies. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce the panel to you. I present them to you in no particular order. First up, Mr. Venkat Maturi. Venkat, if you could wave. Yes, Venkat, who joins us today from Michigan, has business and consulting experience across various countries and has shared his rich experience across leading global business platforms. In addition, he himself has established and scaled up both for-profit and not-for-profit ventures. We're happy to have you with us today, Venkat, and look forward to the insights that you have to share. Thank you. I asked Venkat what he does when he isn't advising companies. Turns out he has two passions, music, he plays the keyboard, and photography. Very briefly, Venkat, Venkat tell us about that. Oh, about the photography, or you want to tell me, it, you want me to tell, tell about either, my work? Either, you can make your pick. Your, no, no, about the, your passions, your passions, the two passions. We'll come to the work in just a bit. Absolutely, absolutely. In fact, I would like to speak about my photography in the light of collaborations that can happen across states. Mm. Incidentally, Prime Minister Modi's Ek Bharat, Shrest Bharat initiative, wherein he advised how sister, two different states can come together and operate as sister states and can teach each other better understanding of a range of uh, aspects, not just economy, not just culture or language, but how perhaps there could be lots of symbiotic relationships that could that would create get created. And uh, one of the I would say not so intense yet a very significant initiative was when eight photographers, including myself from Haryana, went into Telangana state to create a, a coffee table book for the Ministry of Tourism in Telangana, and how we wanted to in this process shift the perspectives about Telangana uh, from being just about an IT state to having much more than IT. Nice. Thank you for that. Next up, Tim Dyer. Tim, if you could wave. Morning. Tim is CEO and founder of Resolus Consulting, which offers business consulting services in, among other things, supply chain strategy. Tim's particular focus is on the defense sector, and we are hoping he can share his thoughts on the opportunities opened up by the recent reforms in this space in India. Tim is based in the UK, but today he comes to us from The Hague in the Netherlands. We are happy to have you with us, Tim, even though we know it's an unearthly hour for you. I asked him to tell me something about him that's slightly offbeat. 
turns out that Tim was a trained chef. How did that happen, Tim? Uh, well, well, good morning, uh, Venki panel, and, and everybody in Horace just listening to this this morning. Um, well, primarily it was geared around my, my dear mother was uh, was a cook, a chef, and um, I don't think she trusted a, a, a six foot one teenage boy who loved rugby and running to be on his own uh, during school holidays, to be blunt. So uh, her ambition was to drag me into the kitchens and work with the chefs and the school chefs to uh, learn something, more importantly, and also just to keep an eye on me to make sure that I was behaving myself rather than running around and enjoying myself in my time off. So I think that's really where it comes from. And, of course, it's a, it's a, it's a valuable skill, um, as anybody knows who can cook, and it, it's also a huge um, opposite to what you do for a living. So it's always good to have something outside of what you do for a living that's completely Absolutely. associated with it. So it's, it's a good skill. Thank you for that. Next up, I'm happy to introduce S. Anand. Anand, if you could wave. Anand, the CEO of Gramina, which uses data visualization and data storytelling to help companies make critical decisions backed by data-led insights. Anand is rated among India's top 10 data scientists. In addition to having scaled up Gramina as a startup, Anand and his team mentored startups. And we are hoping he'll share with us some of his own experience and that of the startup team mentors in coping with challenges. He comes to us today from Bangalore. Happy to have you with us, Anand. Let me ask you this. Thank what you. does Gramina mean? Is it like a portmanteau word? Um, it's actually, it has two meanings. Uh, the first is the businesses that we chose to get into, which was rural BPO and hence Gra and energy management and hence Enna. Uh, it was within a year that we pivoted away from that, but the name stuck. It has a second reason as well. Mm -hmm. If you take the, well, there are six co-founders, and if you take the first letters of each of the co-founders' names and string them together. I see. Again. The second, if you have to visualize today's crisis and its impact on the startup and broader business ecosystem using the data storytelling technique that Gramina specializes in, how would you do that? Do you have something that's, uh, that you can illustrate it by? I would have loved to show you a, a comic strip that uh, actually shows us that, unfortunately, thanks to COVID, the uh, printing resources seem to have been stopped. We are all living in difficult, difficult times. But I do understand there's something in your past involving a Calvin and Hobbes comic strip. Tell us that story. So uh, I am a huge Calvin and Hobbes fan. So in 2001, I started once I got my very first laptop typing out every single strip because I just wanted to be able to search for that particular strip at any point in time. It took me seven years. So in 2007, I managed to complete it. I still have that collection. 2009, I put it online so that the world could enjoy it. Uh, within a few weeks, it hit the top of Reddit and Slashdot and a few other sites. And the next morning, I woke up to a digital millennium copyright act, take down notice <laughs> So you got to cease and desist. Yep. So I seized and desisted, but I still enjoy that collection myself. <laughs> Thank you for that. Next up, Viraj Panse, who's, uh, who's in Berkeley. Viraj is fellow at the Berkeley Angel Network, a group of investors who are drawn from the alumni faculty and former faculty of UC Berkeley. He comes to us from the Bay Area, and we are hoping he can offer unique outside-in perspective on how investors are redrawing their funding strategies in response to the COVID-19 crisis, particularly to the extent that their own investment timelines and the valuations of the businesses that they are invested in have been upset. Welcome, Viraj. If you could wave the camera. I asked Viraj to tell me something quirky about himself, and he had a curious story from his childhood that he would like to share. It involves a wild mongoose. Tell us, Viraj. Thanks, thanks, Venki. Um, so the story goes where uh, a wild mongoose used to visit me um, as as a, as a, as a uh, child, as a toddler. Uh, I was one and a half years old uh, when uh, all this happened, and uh, the mongoose uh, used to visit me at least for uh, uh, like twice or thrice uh, a day, and that continued for six, seven months, eight months, uh, a year. 
and uh, that got published in one of the local newspapers as well so uh, quite a funny and uh, intriguing story that i had <laughs> child yeah that's fun a mongoose whisperer next up we have miss navanvita bora sachdev navanvita if you could wave yeah. for the camera navanvita is editor of the tech panda it's a digital media platform that tracks startups and other businesses in the technology space we are hoping to get her to share her observations as someone who has a bird's eye view of the startup landscape she comes to us today from medellin in colombia welcome navanvita oh, thank you thank you as with all the others i asked her to tell me something unique or quirky about herself what she did not tell me was that she had a has she had a collection of short stories published what she did tell me was that actually i'll let her say it it has something to do with cartoons um yeah actually yeah uh, i'm a big fan of cartoons and uh, i still watch cartoons i still sit and watch cartoons like gumball and all these cartoons are like one of my favorites and i used to watch them when i was little and then i started watching them with my sister she grew up then my son has come now i'm watching with him now he's also starting to outgrow but maybe so i'm waiting for my grandchildren i'll watch with them mm -hmm. let's jump thank you for that let's jump right into it i'm going to ask each of the panelists to make an opening statement take me up no more than 2 minutes each they could lay out the terrain as they see it the challenges the policy initiatives needed and the emerging opportunities sort of a broad overview before we get into the trenches can i ask you to begin venkat definitely thank you venki and it's a pleasure to be knowing each of the panelists and i also do look forward to being more wiser after hearing uh, thoughts from each of the panelists and of course through the q and a uh, but the way i see it uh, on this topic in the era of covid i believe something has happened because of the pandemic and um, while what has happened because of the pandemic has ramifications and implications across the world and the nuances will be different for a country or a region or a business or an industry focusing on india i believe the scope of uh, ventures or startups or entrepreneurship has significantly changed because of the pandemic and i feel all these years whatever we have been doing about startups or the venture environment uh, we could completely uh, set them aside not the learnings but the mechanics and i believe uh, uh, we are probably at a important point where entrepreneurship has to be significantly uh, rewired to deliver at scale and when i talk about scale most of entrepreneurship till now was at a sectoral level at best it was not even at an industry level whereas we are now talking of uh, how do you now start responding at a regional level or continental level or maybe at a global level center from india and whether that's possible or it's not possible and one reason why i feel so is uh, there is credible uh, uh, i think there is a, there is credible um, uh, proof that the world wants to see a rebalancing mm -hmm. in the favor of india mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll expand and, on all of these themes in a little while. Yes, um, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to you. Venkat, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Anand, would you want to give a broad overview in just a couple of minutes over the terrain that you, as you see it from here, is it tectonic shift, plate shifting, as uh, Venkat seems to suggest? I definitely believe that's a huge part of it. I also see this in the context of uh, the financial impact, really. Uh, this is the single biggest economic event that we've seen since world war 2 globally and it caught up in the middle of this as a challenge what i see is that it's for several organizations a survival challenge the sheer number of startups that have reached out to me my colleagues saying well we are looking to exit and can we move on is an indication of one of the most fundamental challenges the first one at a startup basis which is cash flow is that going to be hit the short answer is yes for the majority of it it is of course also an opportunity uh, and for the ones that are able to survive this hurdle and move on to the next round it's a profitability issue it's a question of how long can we continue this until 
the economic situation changes. Uh, I see technology as something that is changing the way in which we do things dramatically, but the first impact that I'm seeing is more financial than technological. I think that gives me a nice way to segue into the next panelist, uh, Viraj, because uh, Anand mentioned cash flows and profitability and so on. So as an investor, how has the landscape changed dramatically for you or has it uh, fundamentally, has it changed? And right. So uh, the way I see uh, uh, the startup world, the startup ecosystem, especially in India, uh, is uh, these startups had a, a major challenge where they did not have proximity with the customers. And that actually is changing big time with uh, uh, the pandemic, where uh, the world now sees value in uh, the solution, uh, the product that the startup is coming up with, uh, rather than where the startup is coming uh, coming from, and what kind of funding, what kind of connects, what kind of uh, uh, special scenarios, uh, and from a geography standpoint, or maybe from a security uh, technology standpoint so uh, they face so what is what is changing right now is uh, since um, um, we are all exposed to uh, the virtual world uh, the proximity with the customers is definitely decreasing uh, for these startups and uh, what i've also seen is uh, with uh, the education system in india uh, with uh, the, the technological progress that is happening uh, especially on uh, the cloud, the big data, the analytics side. Um, what we are seeing is uh, uh, the infrastructure required to build cutting edge startups has definitely uh, been less expensive and that is in favor of India. Uh, and what I see is from that perspective is where um, building startups coming up with great products, uh, the challenge, the delta that, that you used to see uh, with respect to maybe the Silicon Valley, that's decreasing. And now with the pandemic, uh, with the virtual world uh, uh, entering this uh, unique uh, space, I think uh, it's more easier for startups to even uh, uh, get the traction, get the customers. So as long as they are able to keep the cost low, uh, and stay profitable, uh, I think it's easier to achieve uh, uh, going forward. I take some of those as positives. We'll get into the trenches in a little while. Uh, thank you for that perspective. Navanvita, uh, as somebody who, who overarching has a bird's eye view of that landscape, what do you see? What do you see that's good or bad or ugly? Um, see, uh, I feel like COVID has definitely brought in a lot of bad news. But at the same time, th there is also a side which is rising. You know, we see, okay, so nine out of 10 startups are poised to be maybe shut down so that that is like the worst part of it layoffs are happening funding is going bad everything but on the other side there are certain aspects which i feel we have either avoided or ignored in the past in digitalization maybe for example like work from home or robotics so these are now rising and so there there i see hope yeah. Yeah. We'll come to the we'll come to the specific details in just a little while. But Tim, uh, how does the view from the UK or the the Hague, wherever you are, uh, look to you from outside in? How what does it look like? I mean, are you and particularly when you compare it to the geographies, other geographies that you operate in, how badly or uh, well off is India? I think India finds itself in um, in a really advantageous position right now. The human capital in India is is very big in terms of its uh, size and its education and its capability. Uh, India stands at the threshold here of, of, of changing its, its landscape and its, its image on the world stage uh, for the better uh, and, and creating an opportunity for everybody in India with everybody now talking about addressing their supply chains and whether they should be more national, regional or stay with a global uh, footprint is, is on everybody's topic in the West now. And if you if you view major corporations, certainly in my world, in my core world of defense, people still think globally, but they're now starting to address the inner componentry and the makeup of complex systems of systems. So India finds itself now uh, in a real position of opportunity to completely transform its defense and its aerospace sector. Uh, the skill sets are there. Uh, I think it's just the will now to move forward. And I think some of the other panelists have already said, you know, cash flow and investment is, is it has been curtailed 
over this period, which is obvious. I mean, it's, it's the one area that's affected all countries without question. But I think India is in a, a prime position because, as we all know, out of chaos comes opportunity. So I think it's a really good place to be right now. Um, it's about harnessing that capability and moving it forward. Yeah, thank you for that, Tim. Uh, all I can see is sunny optimism. I'm going to be a bit of a grunge to understand. Viraj, if I may <laughs> come back to you. Indian startups had one of their best years in 2019 in terms of uh, funds raised. But uh, the, the COVID crisis has probably disrupted that, that universe. How are in investors reframing their strategies and expectations in respect of the startups that they fund? Right. So um, if, if you look at the overall uh, in investment uh, landscape ecosystem, right, um, what you see is a paradox. And what I mean by that is uh, there is no dearth of capital. Uh, capital uh, is available to be deployed, but to the right opportunity. And with that comes in the cautious uh, behavior of uh, the investors and the, the way they are pursuing uh, and perceiving things, right? Um, so if we if we took uh, take a look at uh, the valuations uh, for these startups, definitely uh, the, there is a correction uh, that is uh, being seen in the market, and there are intrinsic and extrinsic factors to this. Uh, and what I mean by that is extrinsic in a way where uh, at a macro level uh, the risk taking appetite of uh, uh, the investors in general is uh, uh, reducing. And with that comes in a higher discount rate uh, that these uh, startups consider. And uh, at the same time, uh, if you look at the startups, um, gone are the days when startups are evaluated just on growth. Uh, but rather, uh, now the world views them from uh, two lenses. One is growth and profitability. So I think things have come down to the basics where uh, investors expect the startups to uh, be profitable, uh, to be able to scale. Uh, and keep the cost at the minimum, uh, given that uh, there's a lot of less investment that needs to be done on uh, uh, the human capital. Uh, human capital and uh, the availability of human capital has become global. And from there, uh, what, what we also see is, uh, uh, as investors, uh, the growth potential and the growth opportunities for startup, uh, no one is ready to discount that. So that's the paradox that we see. A lot of capital, uh, but a lot of caution that comes along with that. So I guess, yeah, I can, I can, I can sense where you're coming from. We'll get, we'll again get into the trenches there. Uh, Venkat, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, you advise startups in India and elsewhere. How did the, how does the scenario that Viraj just, likes, just laid out in terms of excess capital chasing projects that are more sustainable? How does it square with your own experience of the startups that you work with? Well, to an extent, uh, I resonate with the views that uh, my fellow panelists have shared, but things have changed and I will keep belaboring on that particular point. And I think we need to make two different worlds come together, especially in the Indian context. I'll go back to some uh, some uh, trends or some, some perspectives. Traditionally, the startups in India have been consumption or services led. And if I look at COVID, if I look at harnessing what Tim had mentioned about, we probably need to definitely move from consumption and services to production and even systems. We need to create those, we need to create those spaces now. Now the point, and if I, if I connect back to some numbers and finances, if you look at a typical unicorn in India, the investment, the cash investment that might have gone into the business before it became a unicorn could be anywhere between $300 million to even $2 billion. Whereas when you're talking of creating this production environments or systems, you're talking of investments which will probably be in the region of 15 to $20 billion just for one potentially medium-sized ecosystem. Now, that, now that's the world. So there, there are absolutely different kind of players who need to now come into this space. That's, number po that's, that's an important point. That being said, is there a role for the traditional startups in the traditional sense of the word? I do believe so, yes. So there are certain toolkits, there are certain frameworks, there's certain wisdom, there are certain ecosystems. But if you look at the new scope of the problem, suddenly all this acquired intelligence and capability now becomes a class C item. And they will probably have to move to somebody else's rhythm and rhyme. And I think that is the narrative that we need to, first of all, secure. And that's uh, that's the ecosystem that we need to prime up. 
Yeah, I take your point. Another that I'm going to ask you to, I'm going to put you in a spot. Where exactly do you stand on the spectrum? I know in your opening remarks, you said that there are some positive takeaways from this. But do you share uh, Viraj's uh, uh, view? Or, or I, I, from what I can sense, I'm making a, a probably exaggerating Venkat's uh, nuance point, which is uh, that he, you know, it, it isn't all uh, you know, sunshine and apple pie, so to speak. So is, where do you stand on the spectrum? I personally believe it's not uh, rosy for businesses, but I think it's rosy for people behind the businesses. They just move into a new area, honestly. The longevity of people is uh, incredible. Um, and I think that's largely happening because the ways in which we are doing business is changing. That's all. So if that means that a particular business model or a particular startup that's going in a certain direction can no longer progress in that way, then heck, Stop it, move on to another one. And it doesn't seem so bad for the person behind it. Pretty disruptive one. But they may end up ahead from what I'm seeing, for instance. Um, approximately for the organizations that uh, did a pivot in 2008 among these startups, uh, a significantly larger proportion uh, compared to those that did not ended up being in the top 20% of their respective industries. What that means is that at points like these, we have a choice, change or don't change. And that change leads to a certain amount of lead. And it's usually a pretty small one. Uh, and actually, it ends up being a 5% lead over competition. But these are the organizations that effectively went on to be the organizations that led the market. And these were organizations that also didn't exist or were practically no ones before. And from people that came in out of nowhere. Is this an opportunity? Yes. But the side is also true. They are lost businesses time. Yes. Uh, Tim, if I may come to you, as you know, uh, get, particularly given your experience in the defense area, as you know, the Indian government has recently opened up some segments of the defense sector to participation by private players. Still in a nascent stage, but this is part of a series of structural reforms undertaken in response to the economic crisis and which extends even beyond the COVID crisis, actually. As someone who's focused on defense areas, are you excited by this? Is there a space for startups to operate here? I, no, I agree. I think, um, I think the path that India is taking with its, um, and there are dramatic changes to the defense sector for India. When you consider you traditionally buy in 70% of your capability, but when you were spending having a budget of nearly 63 billion US dollars in the last financial year, that, that's a huge spend. You know, that's the fifth largest budget in the world. And with the second largest uh, standing uh, armed force in the world, it places India in a really positive position. Um, the fact that you can have foreign direct investment is excellent. Uh, and the opening up of um, the DSPUs, I think, is extremely important for India, because that creates, if it's done properly, and I, I mean that in the nicest sense, it allows startups to be part of that environment. Those environments, when they become more and more privatized and have more external support, create the perfect environment for breeding innovation and change, because aerospace and defense has got a very long gestation period. It's fraught with, with governance and policy and procedure and approvals, all for the right reasons for safety and, uh, you know, non-toxic environments. But the, the issue here is that if you are not able to be in that environment with access to the end user and influencers under a triple helix kind of approach where you have governmental, uh, end user, academia and industry partners, you lose the ability to grow. It's all well and good having innovation and technology, but if you can't apply it, approve it, test it, and give it to somebody in uniform to break so that you can learn from that experience, then the startup will never really gain traction. And by the time you get to the point of having traction, the funds will have ran out and people will have lost interest. So I think the exciting piece here is that opening up. It's just about the mechanism and the policy and the process by which India goes about that. If it's not managed in that way and in that manner, which... I don't want to say emulate some of the things which have taken place in the UK, the US and Europe, but they should look to other countries to perhaps learn where it hasn't gone particularly well because of the human capital and the size of the budget that you have as a nation. It's a perfect breeding ground for innovation, not without its issues, 
and not without its timeline constraints and whether companies will last the path and have the energy to take that is, is another issue. But with the right mentorship, the leadership and the right governance from both government and major OEMs and primes, I think it's possible. But it's a very exciting period in time for India. And I think the world is watching this now. Lovely. Namanvita, I want you to expand on something that you've written about. You've seen instances in specific companies, in specific sectors that are undertaking innovation, even in this challenging business environment. Could you share some of this perspective? Uh, what kind of companies are doing this? What kind of sectors do they operate in? And what kind of innovations are you seeing? I think uh, some of the fa- one of the fastest sectors is one is that, uh, you know, remote working. So because remote working has finally opened up in India, this is something I personally feel close to because I've had problems in the past when employers would just say, no, no, you can't work from home. And now finally that is opening up here. And so many companies have have started uh, remote connectivity services. So that is a rising sector. Then we have innovation in that. Robotics is another one. We have robots on hotel floors, hospital floors, some, some a place where you would never expect it before, even if you suggested it. In normal times, if you even suggest having a robot, it would just, people would just scream and, you know, like, no, we can't have this. But now we, we have them. So those are there. Then, like, in the, in the past one month, the interviews that I have taken, in those I see uh, education, education technology rising so i spoke to this um, person from pogi app it's a it's a startup uh, they 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 give counseling services online uh, they used to give it in person also but ever since the lockdown started they were giving it online and on on telephone so when i asked them what, what their experience was he he was he really surprised me he said that the kind of response we're getting now, we haven't got, we, we did not get in the past eight years. In the last 40 days, we have got so much business because the Indian student finally has time to think about what they actually want to do. And they're not just rushing into engineering or doctor. Yes. So, but yeah, I, I take your point. Anand, is there anything in the data universe that will allow us to infer how transitory or permanent will be the disruptions caused by COVID-19? Do businesses have to rethink their business as usual plan, do you think? We seem to be planning for it already. Uh, for example, the factories that are opening up, they're saying, let's see if we can use the data to proactively figure out who is going to be at risk because they have access through the swipe cards for every single one in every single block of the factory. And we identify that this set of people have been in close proximity for more than half an hour. And therefore, if any one particular group is at risk, who might it spread to? So effectively contact tracing in, into the future rather than into the past. No? And this is not coming from very sophisticated organizations. This is coming from organizations just happen to have the swipe card data. So they're already planning for situations where they could open up even with a certain amount of risk or um, supply chain. So there's this Bala company that said, you know, our supplies are consistently disrupted. And in some cases, the costs are going up. So can we chart out the network of all of the supplies and raw materials as they're coming in and see which is the best alternative for us to construct our drugs in order to be able to produce the same kind of output and also shift to the changing demands that we have. Yeah, my organizations, governments are doing this. Governments are effectively using data to say how we can proactively see the trend and shift in direction. And we've been uh, speaking to the UP government, the Assam government, all of whom are creating a series of war rooms, looking at where exactly are the hotspots and what are the most effective ways of blocking the hotspots, keeping in mind the traffic data that's coming in, to make sure that it causes the least disruption also at the same time has the highest effectiveness. Um, so, yeah, no, I mean, going forward, if anything, I see that we've gotten more creative in the way in which we're using data to change the way in which we do business going forward. Thank you for that. Viraj, even as we speak, 
India and China are locked in a serious standoff in the Ladakh frontier, as I'm sure you know. We've seen loss of lives on both sides. In the weeks and months prior to this, India placed investments from some jurisdictions under review, but it was primarily seen to be targeted at China. Given the extent of Chinese investments in Indian startups, how will this impact the investment world? Right. So um, before going there, uh, let's try to understand the policy uh, at high level. Um, what we currently see is um, India having a ban on the automatic uh, pathway. Uh, yes. FDI and uh, indirect uh, investments as well, right? From any nation that shares a border with, uh, a physical border with uh, India. And um, I mean, the way I'm looking at this is uh, it might turn out to be a very good move uh, for safeguarding the interest of uh, the various startups uh, in India, especially the ones which are at a unicorn level. Now, uh, before I go there, I would also like to state the fact that about 18 uh, to 20 of uh, the top uh, uh, unicorns in India uh, are uh, receiving investments from uh, China uh, and, and uh, the other nations uh, that, that, that share uh, a border with India. Uh, but the fact is uh, that if you look at the current ban, it would definitely open a pathway for investors from other nations uh, to invest into these startups um, and get more traction uh, on, on that front. And that uh, and what it also helps is uh, basically if the market really goes down and um, the valuations of these so-called unicorns uh, re really go, go down drastically, uh, it would definitely uh, help safeguard our interests uh, in, in a world where uh, uh, physical wars uh, can't be affordable, can't happen, but trade wars are always uh, on an increase, as we've seen uh, uh, across uh, the globe. And I think that's where uh, uh, such moves will definitely uh, be helpful. Um, but but I think uh, along with that, we also need to take a look at um, some other aspects uh, as part of uh, the relationship that we have here. Uh, what are we doing on um, the front of the trade deficit that we have with uh, China, which ranges, um, I think more than 50 billion is what we have right now. Uh, how are we safeguarding the uh, interests of our manufacturers, um, the, the people who are uh, uh, not running uh, the tech startups, but maybe um, the cottage industries, the uh, so social impact kind of startups, what's, what's happening with uh, th that area of the world. Um, the other uh, question I also have is, why has this suddenly come forth? Uh, is it the pandemic or is it something else? And what I mean by that is uh, 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 we were receiving investments from China and uh, what it also entails is at some point or some moment in time, the world uh, market was going to go down. Didn't we see this happening? Uh, didn't we see this forthcoming? So some of these questions are really uh, unanswered. And uh, I think uh, we're taking a look. Um, and I think uh, the government could also think of some alternatives, like maybe um, uh, having more uh, power, more uh, investments being made in these startups, uh, maybe setting up a government fund to uh, have more control. So did we think I of Yeah, I, I take your point, yeah. Tim, uh, I, I'm going to come back to you with a similar question. All around the world, there's been a felt need to diversify supply chain dependence away from China. This has happened even before the COVID crisis, uh, even before this latest tension. You, you know, it has happened as part of the COVID crisis. India has articulated a desire to attract some of that supply chains by, you know, become a manufacturing hub. How realistic is that earning you feel? I think it's... Um... I think it's a big, it's a big challenge. It's, it's a huge ask. I mean, China hasn't become a, a first world industrial nation, if you will, in the past 10 years. It's, it's taken 30 plus years and billions of dollars of investment. Major Western organizations have had manufacturing plants and IPs offices in that country to help develop and skill them. And of course, they've reached the kind of third stage of industrialization where the enduring capability is there and they're growing. Um, I think it's unrealistic to think that you can just swap that to India. It's actually unrealistic to think you can swap that to any other country, actually. Um, 
bulk of the raw materials if you think but about you've it. seen but you've seen some of that moving to the asean countries uh, right? no 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 i agree but we, you have to think of what what what's your your view in terms of not your view it, generically if you want to move away from china are you talking 100% move away from china in which case you have to consider the raw material in your base manufacturing where is that coming from it's probably still coming from china directly or indirectly so you still have a dependency on china i think what we need to do is assess india's national security and its strategic needs to understand what those vertical market sectors are we need to assess what those supply chains look like in india and determine what the as is and the to be looks like so that we understand what capability and capacity is missing in india and we need a concertive industrial effort to develop that and i think that is that is the crucial step all countries in the west are looking at this as well uh, there's a lot of rhetoric around it but i think a lot of people now are looking in the mirror thinking mm, hang on a second 35 years 40 years developing a nation we can't switch it off because become 100% reliant but we're going to have to do it gradually and it has to be around what's national security requirement not generic yes i see that <laughs> yes i i see what you mean venkat uh, we're getting close to the hour so we're going to wind down but i'm going to ask you one last quick question and and i need a quick response from you uh, addressing the same point that uh, that i asked tim but in a from a different direction you work closely with uh, family business uh, startups in india or even if they are not startups they are third generation they work mm-hmm. like startups right mm-hmm. so in your estimation are indian startups and uh, and traditional businesses well placed to seize the day that is the opportunities that are opening up for them particularly from a diversification away from china or uh, you know the the or the challenges thrown up by covid are they well placed to seize the, the moment or are they looking for policy guidance or as uh, say ownership of the situation how they, are you, do you see something of that and then i'll quickly come quickly quick point and then i'll come back for closing statements well i think a, I, i think a neat answer would be no they are not ready in mm. part because they don't see the dest- the locus of control of their destiny within themselves they they seem to be seeing the destiny as a consequence of somebody else's decision and mm. the quick point is also that it's not about rebalancing entirely from china off to india what's happening now is the world understands that it's now important to have another large economic capacity which can which can receive a lot of interest from the world even something as simple as education for example now that's something i'm working on if you want to set up a regional uh, capacity to deliver us education uh, instead of moving students to canada australia and us and therefore you want to set up a large indian university in a australian campus or in singapore campus we suddenly realize we don't have players we don't have policies and we don't even have imagination so yeah so there is a problem there thank you for that yeah you need a, a more realistic perspective yes so i just want to quick, quickly come for closing statements from each of you in under 30 seconds i'm sorry i'm rushing you but we are close to time uh, starting with you venkat closing mm-hmm. statement how do you see the the future panning out i think the future is good there is lots of upside but we need to change our ways dramatically at all sectors mm. uh, venkat uh, sorry uh, uh, anand I see us as having been a nation that balanced regard and policy and got used to both education i find that uh, when schools started opening in june parents fake children's birthdays to get them admitted in june which meant that june born children on average would be the lowest scoring children across any batch today we have a completely new way of teaching the colonial so to speak who are going to school during the year of this metal crack the chinese year Uh, what's the trade off going to be in terms of jugard and policy i just hope that the home grown innovation will actually beat any kind of long term dangerous impact of policy yes thank you for that viraj a closing statement what what do you need to see in terms of policy action or whatever else the, the investors are looking for the cues that you're looking for 30 seconds yeah so um uh I think if uh, someone is just starting off right um, in a startup world I think uh, uh, they should just stick to their jobs uh, and stay away from uh, starting anything new uh, but if you are talking about an early stage startup uh, not pre series a is what I'm talking about uh, they should focus on uh, uh, their product development and build a great product because this is the right time the right opportunity and if you are past that stage uh, open uh, yourself to the uh, Uh, global opportunities and see if you can do something uh, uh, globally uh, leveraging uh, the virtual world uh, that you are, the whole uh, world is exposed to right i have a feeling we are going to be cut short very soon so i'll just quickly i'm sorry navanita and tim i'm not able to come to you uh, i i just going to make my uh, closing statement if i were to encapsulate the views of the panelists as i've been recording them 
The challenge is immense, but the crisis of also offers some opportunity for genuine innovation to flourish. And with the right in incentives, startups can get a second wind if they draw on data driven insights and reorient their strategies to make the most of the new landscapes that are opening up. A panel of experts identified. I, I was hoping to get you to identify some of the uh, sectors that will be specific, uh, specifically, uh, you know, be, oh, you know, they'll see a resurgence on that optimistic note. I draw this conclusion to a close. My thanks to the panelists for their excellent insights, to Horasis for providing this platform, and to the audience from all around the world. Stay safe and always hold hope in your hearts. Thank you, folks. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.